Welcome to Beg to Differ, the Bulwark's weekly roundtable discussion featuring civil conversation across the political spectrum, from center left to center right. I'm Mona Charon, syndicated columnist and policy editor at the Bulwark. I'm joined by our regulars, Damon Linker of the Week, Bill Galston of the Brookings Institution and the Wall Street Journal, and Linda Chavez of the Niskanen Center. Our special guest this week is David French of Time Magazine and The Dispatch. Uh, Welcome, David. Welcome, panel. Uh, The first topic that I'd like to get to this week is the attempt that is uh, brewing, even as we speak, to defenestrate Liz Cheney. Um, the, uh, uh, the majority, the minority leader has made it very clear, uh, partly by a thinly disguised, uh, hot mic moment, which I very much doubt was a true hot mic moment. That is, he knew he was being recorded, that he's tired of her. He's, he's had it with her. And, um, uh, the, uh, second, the, 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 uh, second in command, uh, for the GOP, Steve Scalise has echoed this. So, um, there is a, there is an attempt going on. Um, I'm going to start with you, David, the, uh, uh, Liz Cheney wrote an impassioned, uh, piece that appeared in today's print edition of the Washington post in which she laid out the stakes here, uh, she well, she she said that this is really about whether our democracy whether whether the republican party um adheres to the basic the most basic rules of our democracy uh and the and the, there have been numerous stories in right wing media um, that no, that's not it. It's the Cheney's annoying, or that she's too much of a rhino, or that she's a she's too tough on foreign policy questions, or she didn't return somebody's phone call. Um, what's your view? I mean, look, this is the easiest analysis in the history of yep. the world. This is about Trump. This is about the fact that she rejects him and won't stop talking about it. Now, you know, they may have uh, given her a pass if she had, you know, voted to impeach and set her piece back in January of this year and then just moved on to be anti-Biden pro-Dr. Seuss all the time. Uh, But she won't stop talking about it. Now, of course, if you're talking about who's who's moving on and who's not moving on, you know who's not moving on from the election is Trump. But nobody has a problem in the House Republican conference with Trump still talking about it, or if they have a problem with it, all but the tiniest handful are entirely keeping that to themselves. So, I mean, this is, this is incredibly easy analysis. He won't move on. uh, And she, and so long as he won't move on, she won't move on. And so long as he talks about it, she will talk about it because she wants the truth to be heard on the election that she believes rightly that the Republicans desperately need to understand the truth about the election. It's vital for the health of our country. And so all of this nonsense about what she won't move on is just nonsense. We know who doesn't move on. It's Donald Trump who's not moving on. She shouldn't move on so long as he doesn't. And the House Republicans know where their loyalties lie. Bill Galston, um, uh, Rick Scott traveled down to Mar-a-Lago, gave former President Trump an award. Ted Cruz was just there the other night. Uh, uh, Kevin McCarthy has been there. Um, Would-be candidates uh, for president troop to Mar-a-Lago for his blessing. Um, And the, um, the guy who ran in the Texas 6th District uh, for an open seat there uh, who campaigned explicitly on the Republican Party needs to break up with Trump. Uh, his name was Michael Wood. He was in every imaginable respect the ideal Republican candidate, young, dynamic, military experience, great advanced degrees. Uh, but he got 3.2% of the vote. Um, so you know, the, the it's pretty clear, isn't it, that 
the Republican Party, which for like about 30 seconds after January 6th, made some noises about um, breaking up with Trump, uh, is now as firmly in his control as ever, if not more. Well, you're absolutely right, Mona. Uh, And I'll echo David French. This is the easiest analysis in the history of the world. Uh, Every poll I look at tells me that about seven in 10 Republicans agree with Trump that the election was stolen. Uh, The Republican Party is now Donald Trump's party. I don't know that it will remain Donald Trump's party forever, but as long as it is his party, uh, the default setting will be to you know, troop to Mar-a-Lago uh, to kiss his ring, if they're lucky, uh, and get his blessing. Uh, and that's the way it is. I don't know, don't know what more to say. I am astonished, uh, but not entirely surprised that seven out of 10 Americans who identify with the Republican Party uh, see things that way. And it says a lot about the state of our politics and the state of our society that things have come to this pass. Linda, speaking of the state of our society uh, and our politics, um, here's a little nugget. Um, The Michigan GOP has announced that it has invited Naomi Wolf to come and address them. Now, (laughs) Naomi Wolf. What? Yep. (laughs) <laughs> but you're surprised you're surprised by this, this- <laughs> she she has been um a little let's say um odd in her views now for many years and has suggested over the years for example that um american troops this is back in 2014 she said that american troops had been sent to africa not to help with fighting ebola but to bring ebola back here so that there would be an excuse for a military coup in America. Um, She has said that videos of ISIS beheading Americans were faked. Most recently, she said that uh, Anthony Fauci doesn't work for us because he got an award from the state of Israel for contributions to public health. Uh, This is the kind of person, apparently, the, the, the main qualification for being invited to speak to Republican groups now is that you be bat, you know what, crazy. Um, and, and that is a measure um, that with Michael Woods, 3.2% of the vote. I don't know, Linda, if you saw the Arizona guy who is participating in the recount, there's another recount in Arizona. Oh, this is strictly by Republicans who was, uh, uh, thanks to our producer, Jim Swift, for posting a video of this fellow explaining that they are looking, when they go through these ballots, they're looking for evidence of bamboo because- I saw yes, that. Because they <laughs> think there that. were thirty to 40,000 ballots that mm-hmm. were shipped in mm-hmm. from China. The other day at the press conference, you were talking about bamboo. What was that about? Well, is that there's accusations that 40,000 ballots were flown in. To Arizona? To Arizona, and it was stuffed into the box, okay? And it came from the southeast part of the world, Asia, okay? And, uh, and what they're doing is to find out if there's bamboo in the paper. Yep. Absolutely. Well, uh, first of all, you know, you're telling me all this new stuff about Naomi Wolf that I didn't even know about. Uh, I, when, when you say Naomi Wolf, what I think about, she was the feminist consultant to Al Gore. Remember? Yes, yes. You know, and and I don't know. She had some weird views about you know dress yes. and colors yeah. and all, all sorts yeah, of very strange earth, earth tones, tones. Earth right. tones. Earth yes tones. yes right that's how it would, so when you say Naomi <laughs> Wolf that's what i think of but look the the problem is it's not just a threat to the republican party that they are wrapping themselves in uh in donald trump the fact is if you continue to have one of the major parties in the united states that accounts for about half of voters not quite obviously because they didn't win last time uh but 
70% of that group of people who are unwilling to accept the results of an election, you have essentially blown up democracy. You cannot have a democracy when all parties do not agree to accept uh, the results of the election. And it, it is really, truly frightening to me that people who know better, like Kevin McCarthy, like Steve Scalise, like Mitch McConnell, like all of the leadership in the Republican Party, have not had the, pardon the expression, but the cojones to go down to Mar-a-Lago and to tell Donald Trump, if you want to be involved in this party in the future, you've got to stop this sore loser bit uh, that the election was stolen. This is dangerous. It is bad for democracy, and it is bad for the future of the Republican Party. If enough people were willing to do that, he no longer has, he meaning Trump, no longer has control of a Twitter account with tens of millions of, of uh, people who can hear, hear him tweet or see him tweet. Uh, he doesn't have access to Facebook, which thankfully um, upheld and, and furthered the Facebook jail uh, term to six months for Donald Trump. So unless you can get Republicans to do that, um, I, I think we're really in in um, in a very very perilous state. I think it's really the not the future of the Republican Party. It's the future of democracy. If that many Americans don't accept uh, that we have free and fair elections here in the United States, so I I I see your point, Linda, and I'm going to raise you uh, because it's not only that they believe that the election was stolen against all the evidence. It's that they don't think January 6th was that big a deal, right? They really don't think that matters so much that we should just forget it. We should move on. And, and bear in mind, when, when Donald Trump spoke to the CPAC conference in, in February, what did he do? He went on one of his grievance rants. And part of his grievance was that Mike Pence did not have the guts to do what he should have done. So what he is saying is that Pence should have declined to certify the election results. Meanwhile, the violent gang was beating down the doors that, that Pence should have declined. And therefore, what? Therefore, the, the election would have been thrown into uh, confusion about who the true winner was. Maybe the different state delegations would then begin to um, reassess uh, who they wanted to send and so on and so forth. And that, that is what the Republican Party is saying is fine, that they are okay with that, that, that from now on, our elections will be decided uh, by who has a bigger gang uh, uh, of thugs who can come and intimidate the Congress while it's counting the votes. And this time, most of them were not armed, but next time, who's to say? All right, so I'm turning to you, Damon. Um isn't this, I mean, the, the, so the parlous state of the Republican party and Linda's, you know, I totally second what Linda said about it being much bigger than the Republican party. It's a danger to the country. Um, but in light of that, doesn't this sort of cry out for the democratic party to, um, rein in its own extremists so that they can be appealing to people in the middle and not, you know, and not have those people fleeing into the arms of a completely irresponsible party, namely the Republicans? Uh, well, sure. I mean, there are certain <laughs> parallels between the two parties. They each have uh, a restive base uh, that is demanding certain things that aren't really, I think, in the interest of the country. Although the difference is that, 70%, as we keep saying, of the Republican Party believes a complete delusional fantasy about reality, whereas on the Democratic side, it's something like maybe 20% to 30% at the most of the party is sort of involved in a sort of quasi-religious activist mindset. Uh, and then, of course, 
Biden is doing all kinds of things in economic policy that some people in the centrist in the center aren't entirely comfortable with, but I don't think that part of it is really comparable. Um, and so the Republicans, I think, are definitely the more dangerous of the two. And I mean, you ask you ask the Biden administration your question, and they would say, "We're already doing that. We're we're governing responsibly. We you know we have this economic agenda." It seems to be pretty popular in the polls. And so, you know, those sensible Republicans who have decided rightly that their party has gone off the deep end, they can come right over to us right now. We're happy to have them. Um, so I'm not sure what the incentive structure is for Democrats to do much more than they already have and blow up their own electoral coalition as a result. I did want to loop back to the Cheney situation Um I have to say, I'm going to put on my, as I do periodically here on the podcast, the, the my cynic hat of, in this crowd and simply say, what exactly do you realistically expect the Republican leadership to do? And, and, and paired with that, what exactly does Cheney think she's accomplishing at this point? The, there seems to be a kind of ongoing fantasy that somehow if certain elites in the party, including Cheney, including McCarthy and others, kind of stand up and denounce not just Trump, but the 70 percent who support Trump, that somehow that does something to make this go away. When in fact, what it would do is split the party in two and ensure that it would lose the power that it has because you would effectively be cutting apart the Trumpists from what are a much smaller faction of more sensible centrist types represented by some people on this podcast. Um, and, you know, if you want to run a kamikaze mission against the Republicans because they are such a threat to democracy, then, yeah, that's a viable path. But it would be good if for people to admit that that is actually what they're calling for, which is and it appears that Cheney is is setting herself up to do that. I mean, she probably will lose her leadership position. She may lose reelection at the next in 2022. And if that happens, she might run a third party uh, in order to torpedo the Republicans in 2024. Um, but that's very different than actually thinking that the result is going to be we're going to somehow get the party back and it's going to be like, you know, George W. Bush era again, or even Mitt Romney era again, uh, when he ran in 2012. So um, on that question, I, I sort of watch this and I'm perplexed. Like, yes, at the level of principle, I get there's something admirable about what Cheney's doing, but like strategically, politically, what exactly is the end game of this acting out? the op-ed attacking the party over and over and over again. Like what does she think good is going to come okay, from so that? Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to respond to that. First of all, she hasn't attacked the party, <laughs> right? She has, a, she has responded to the big lie. When, when Trump keeps repeating it, she keeps rebutting it. That's all she's doing. Okay. And you know, you might've thought that after Trump is out of office, having been denied his platforms, on social media, um, that this was a an opportunity for the elites in the party and for the party in general to um, begin to uh, distance themselves from Trump, and um, and so that it seems to me, if if there had been other people who uh, who followed her lead, it might have made a difference. Look, you, you know the the sure there's a big problem with the base, but but. The base takes its cues from elites. Let's face it. The elites they happen to follow the most slavishly are people like Tucker Carlson. Um, uh, but but the elites matter. And you will see constantly when, when they are sort of justifying their support for Trump, they always pull in people like, you know, Chris Christie and various others for, for legitimacy. And the more the, the elites refuse to stand on principle, the more they give that legitimacy. So, um, so I think, I, yeah, I mean, I see your point. I mean, I guess I stand with Aristotle and distinguishing between like, what is, what is true and then what is true simply or what is just and then what is just simply like when it comes to what's right i'm absolutely with you on this and i think it's good 
for Lynn Cheney to take her stand Liz. and for others to Liz, sorry, yeah. Liz, sorry, uh, to, to take her stand and and actually insist that Trump is lying in the hopes that this will get some traction and maybe persuade a few people. I just think politically at this point, the problem, I think, is the base and the elites, I, I think, are just following the cues of their own voters and then trying to kind of act out of self-preservation in, in placating them. And so, I mean, it's it's an old joke that, you know, the problem is we need to elect a new electorate. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's the problem on the right right now. And I don't see... Um, you know, I, I, I don't I don't see a way forward through the elite path at this point. Can I agree with both? Sure, of you? Sure. Go for it. Please do. <laughs> Beg not to differ. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think, you know, to, to Mona's point, if, thing, if there's one thing that we've learned, you can't beat Trump with nothing. And that, you know, time and time and time again, there has been this thought that, well, eventually he's going to go too far. Every eventually the hold will loosen. And, you know, going all the way back to early 2016, you know, it seemed as if Trump was sort of careening through the primary and people were just waiting for the combustion. And then they were just being a little bit very delicate with him because they, they wanted to be the one to get his followers. And so we've had this, this consistent pattern in practice throughout the last five years where either no one, the hope is that Trump, Trump uh, finally goes too far and you don't have to actually do anything to knock him off, or you're going to delegate that to the Democrats all the while standing in their way as, as best you can by voting against impeachment and voting to acquit him. And so there's always been this, he's going to have to just kind of fade away on his own. So Liz Cheney is saying, nope, I'm going to stand up there. It's not going to be just Mitt Romney anymore. It's going to be somebody else. And you know, the hope, I think the, the desire would be to say, okay, if some this is the start of something. This isn't the whole of the strategy. This is the start of something. But now I got to agree about the base. I mean, the base right now, I mean, if you're going to, I was talking to somebody who's very well plugged into the uh, Williamson County Re Republican. I'm in Williamson County, Tennessee. Williamson County, Tennessee is kind of a piggy bank of the GOP. It's a very, very red place. I did that little New York Times tool where you were trying to figure out what kind of bubble mm -hmm. you're in. And 85% of my neighbors are Republicans. And I found out from talking to these folks who are very plugged in that people are furious at Marsha Blackburn. Furious. Why? Because she didn't do more. She didn't do more to save Trump in the election. <laughs> you know, and I get emails like this. I'm going to quote to you an email I got. You are wrong. Now, normally, quoting email is is kind of nut picking. It's unfair. It's mean. But this is representative of representative of sentiments that I get in real life and online. You are wrong. Trump did not lose the 2020 election any more than Jesus lost the battle between good and evil when he died on a Roman cross. <laughs> and so a lot of a lot of these guys will say to you, what do you want me to do? Because if I stand against Trump, I'm done I'm going to be replaced. And do you think this is good for the country? I'll be replaced by Lauren Boebert. I'll be replaced by Mad uh, you know, Madison Cawthorn. I'll be replaced by Marjorie Taylor Greene. And is that going to be great for America? No. So, so on the one hand, you've got to have leadership. But on the other hand, you also have a giant base problem. And that's that's why I signed in uh, under the name Discouraged in Tennessee in the uh, Zencaster. Yeah. Okay, Bill, you wanted to comment? Uh, yes, just very briefly, Mona. Uh I guess I disagree with you about the extent to which elite opinion has governed the transition to Trump and is ensuring the non-transition away from Trump. Uh, on my reading, Donald Trump won the Republican primary in 2016 because he was saying what the base wanted to hear. Uh, and it, nobody was directing them to ratify Trump's message. They did it on their own. They then proceeded for four years, all four years of the Trump's presidency to give him unswerving support, uh, even in the face of events that would have toppled anyone else. 
So, no, I don't think this is a question of what the elites are thinking or doing. I think it's a question of what the rank and file has come to believe for reasons that I've spent years trying to understand that I'm not there yet. Um, okay, I'll, I'll just, um, we, we need to move on. I will just note, though, that um, the the people uh, who gave him unswerving support, and I agree with your characterization, uh, were getting their news from places like Fox and other outlets that were not telling them the, the real story. So it was, it's a mixed picture. But all right, let's turn now to um, a recent poll, um, and uh, actually, Bill, I want to start with you on this one. Um, there, there was a very interesting poll that came out of the, the University of Michigan um, that uh, on very many subjects, including police reform, and but it also talked about election reform. And one of the striking findings was that support for voter ID which many Democrats view as racist um, and, uh, and, and anti-poor people, um, that there's widespread support for it, even among, um, even among poor people and even among minorities. 62% of African-Americans, 64% of Latinos, 80% of Asians. All support, and 67% of whites, just to finish that out, all support requiring voter ID. Should the uh, Democrats bend on this a little bit, do you think? Absolutely. Okay. It's a no-brainer. And I actually raised this point uh, in a group of election reformers that I meet with every once in a while. Uh, and, And the response that I got was, sure. And But the devil is in the details. And the question is, what will be the range of acceptable voter identification? That, they tell me, is the real debate. Uh, They are not on a kamikaze mission. Uh, They understand uh, that some form of identification uh, enjoys widespread public support, including in the Democratic Party, including in those groups that you just ticked off. And so It's a question of finding a sweet spot where there's enough flexibility in what counts as a valid identification so that you don't have significant subgroups uh, who are experiencing uh, uh, considerable burdens uh, trying to qualify to vote. Linda, um, I do understand um, the attitude of, of some Democrats who say, Well, look, I mean, this whole push for voter integrity laws and for securing the voting process and so on is built on a lie, namely that we had widespread fraud during the 2020 election. And, uh, and therefore they're kind of, it, it sticks in their craw that there, that there's any move to reform the laws as a response to that. Can, do you, do you agree that that's an understandable, uh, resentment? Well, yes, except that voter ID laws uh, have been being offered uh, now for a number of years, and they preceded the uh, 2020 election. So uh, it isn't, you know, the Democrats now saying they oppose these laws because they're built on a lie, well, that's right. um, yeah. you know, I, I, I think um, isn't quite, um, uh, you know, a, uh, an honest appraisal. But um, I do, you know, I do think that we are in a crisis right now in democracy. You can, as I said earlier, you cannot have as many people as do um, believe that the election was stolen. And so we have to do things, I think, to increase confidence in our elections. One of the ways of doing that is to make sure that we are not overcorrecting for, you know, so-called voter fraud, but also that we're um, that we're conscientious. And you do need an ID to get on an airplane. You need an ID to get into most public buildings uh, in large cities in America. You need an ID to, you know, to do all sorts of things and go to the doctor. There are just lots of places where Americans have to have to produce some sort of identification. And if the price of increasing 
faith in the election and ensuring that most Americans accept that the only people who vote are those who are eligible to vote um, is, uh, I don't think having an ID law is too big a price to pay. And you are right that some of the, you know, devil is in the details and it depends on what kind of uh, IDs would be permissible. Obviously, uh, driver's licenses are not entirely universal. I can remember uh, when my mother uh, moved from New Mexico to live with me when I was then living in Virginia and I wanted to take her on an airplane. She needed to come up with a, an ID to get her on a plane and her New Mexico driver's license had long expired. So it was a hassle to go down and get a 90 year old woman uh, an ID. Even getting her birth certificate was difficult. So I understand there are impediments, but we do need to come up with a way with states giving uh, legitimate IDs to everyone who's eligible to vote uh, because they're citizens and because they are the right age. Uh, and I think that's not too much to ask that this be incorporated into our laws if it increases confidence. David French, um, the, this I don't want to make too much of this poll because it is just one poll, but it was uh, 2,000 people. It was carefully done. Um, so they asked the question, do you think that it's um, a good idea to increase election security, even if it makes voting harder? Okay. Now, among the races that were uh, in this survey, you had whites, Latinos, Asians, and African Americans. Majorities of all races, except one, said that they do agree that it's more important to ensure that that it's important to ensure election security even if it makes voting harder. Guess which one didn't agree to that? I don't even want to have it. <laughs> it was whites. Whites. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> Fascinating. Um so uh, what do you what do you uh, think about this issue? Do, do you agree with uh, with Bill and Linda that it's the kind of thing that uh, that Democrats should ease up on and uh, and and reassure people that since it has widespread support? Yeah, I mean, I I, I agree with the no brainer comment that yes, you you ease up on this. In fact. You know, the, the requirement of an ID to do oh, inc an increasing number of things in the United States, almost it, it, it has become so ubiquitous and so common to pull out your ID that it almost feels weird that people would be objecting so strongly to it. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think the, the, the strong objections to an ID for something as important as voting themselves raise a few eyebrows amongst a lot of, I think, reasonable people. What? Mm -hmm. Wait a mm -hmm. minute. I don't, you don't, you think it is wrong for me to show, to verify who I am, that I'm actually the person I say that I am before I vote for the leadership of this country. So yeah, to me, if you're going to be talking about voter suppression, the ID, the requirement for an ID, that ain't it. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. ain't it. If you're going to be talking about restricting uh, precinct, the numbers of precincts, re restricting numbers of voting machines, limiting voting hours, all of those things, making it more difficult, unnecessarily difficult to get an absentee ballot or a mail-in ballot, all of those things. Yeah, let's have the conversation about that. But to to show who you are, to vote, um, that you are who you are, say you are when you vote, you know, that, that one... To me, is it, it's it's just a no-brainer. It feels to me to be sort of a rarefied air kind of um, elite progressive argument. Uh, one one of those issues that is they're not quite in step with their base on. They're not quite in step with sort of where most uh, most Americans are quite sensibly, quite reasonably. So yeah, if you're going to do voting reform, and voting reform includes not having to prove who you are when you show up to vote, uh, that's that's problematic. So, Damon, it seems like we're going to have a uh, beg to agree here that we we're all we're all agreed on this one. <laughs> um, but uh, but let me just raise the the one point that I hear people uh, make who are um, against voter ID, and that is they say um, the the people who tend not to have IDs are disproportionately poor and African-American, or sometimes I'll say rural. Um, 
and uh, and so uh, should should that be a part of, I mean, I think in that, if I remember correctly, that Georgia law, uh, which I had some problems with many features of it, but one of the things that it did that was good was it guaranteed that anybody who wanted, who needed a, an ID and didn't have one could have one free of charge from the state. Um, yeah. I mean, in general, I think, uh, by the way, when, when you ask the question about which of the different groups, the demographic groups, uh, which was the one that was most resistant to ID, and I, I would have, I, I uh, picked white immediately <laughs> because that sort of goes along with the the general tendency of yes the the progress progressive or or liberal whites tend to be really far in the extremes of these of these issues and see kind of racial justice implications to everything right now mm -hmm. but then you also have some kind of hardline uh, libertarian conservatives who probably like want to you know stand stand opposed to any requirement by the government to do anything which probably plays into it a little bit too but on on the larger question i think of course some democrats their attitude about this if they're if they're critical of it is as you said we don't want to do anything to increase the burden of voting voting should be as easy as possible we already require that you uh, register in a lot of places you can't register same day that means that you have to go out of your way to find you know how to get registered figure out where to vote and then uh, obviously uh, deal with the fact that in our country until recently, we we required that you had to vote on one day within certain constrained hours, despite the fact that most people have jobs during the day and can't just get time off work. And then the fact that a lot of states uh, don't allocate, don't have enough precincts, so the lines are often long, especially in poor neighborhoods. All these things, Democrats, their instincts are all make it easier, always easier, never harder. However, another kind of cross-cutting factor has to do with state and federal because Democrats are also very uh, sort of slightly paranoid, I think, for good historical reasons, to the extent that any paranoia is rooted in reality, that you know, certain states, especially in the South, went out of their way to put obstacles in the way of, of African Americans voting. And so they would probably be more open to this if it were national, like a national voter card. Uh, uh, and, and that way they would feel like, okay, at least the federal government is overseeing this. But that cuts completely against the conservative view that voting should remain a state issue. That's one of the main, well, one of many issues that is scuttling and getting in the way of the passage of H.R. 1, the fact that it federalizes so much of this. Um, and so once again, we see that our country is divided uh, and on multiple dimensions. So even when there seems to be general consensus, yeah, we should have us kind of a requirement that you have ID to vote. When it comes down to the question of what the ID should be, who should be in charge of this? Is it a federal rule that applies everywhere equally or should it be handled by states? And should we trust states to make that call? They're going to be very deep disagreements about what the answer to that should be. And the end result is often that nothing ends up happening. So I hope it does. Um, but I, I worry that, uh, it, it might, it might get tripped up in the way so much, uh, so many reform efforts do these days. Okay. Um, I'll just, uh, point out that, uh, enthusiasm for federalizing, uh, elections should have taken a hit, uh, after the Trump <laughs> era, right? I mean, Amen to if, that. if we had not had 50 state elections and Trump and the Republicans had had more power to determine uh, how votes were counted, um, I don't think anybody believes that that would have been a step forward for democracy. So... <laughs> That's a good that's a good classical liberal argument that we should try to have rules that apply equally to all. The problem is both of our parties sort of operate now on the assumption that after the next election, we'll be the only ones in yeah. charge ever again. Yeah, well, right. Yeah. Good luck with that. So I, I'm, I'm with you. Mona. Yeah. All right. Let us turn now to um, the president's proposal, the American Families Plan. 
um, which uh, polls have shown is very popular. Here is a shock. <laughs> the promise to give away free stuff is popular. <laughs> but uh, but no, look, I mean, I'm not saying it's all um, that all of it is a bad idea, but I do have strong feelings about the child care piece. So I'm going to start with, uh, with, with Linda, Linda, did you, um, did you have a chance to look at this, uh, proposal to expand, uh, childcare, daycare subsidies, uh, and universal pre-K? Yes, I did. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) I know why you came to me, Mona. Come on, just be honest. You knew that I was going to say what you want to say. Um, Yeah, no, I look, this bill, first of all, is such an enormous shift. And, you know, we said it, I think I said it last week, that it's an expansion of the welfare state. It's really turning the United States more into a a European style of social democracy. Um, And it's too big and you shouldn't be doing all these things at once. But I'm glad you focus on the child care credit uh, because there is philosophically a difference between those who believe that money should be given by the federal government to set up daycare centers, essentially, for uh, the children of working mothers. And um, that is the way it's done in large uh, portions of Europe. Um, There's also a different way of thinking about it. And that is, if you really want to support children, if, if the goal is to give families incentives to have children and to be able to care for those children and to end child poverty, a better way, uh, and it is done in this bill as well, or it was done in the last bill, is to expand the uh, child allowance and essentially give uh, give a certain amount of money to families. I would base it on income. I would not give it equally to everyone because you're not going to, frankly, incentivize women in the upper income uh, brackets to have more children just because they get a bigger tax write-off. But if your interest is in in, in improving poverty and, and taking care of children, then giving parents money in their pocket to decide themselves whether or not they want uh, one of the two parents hopefully there are two parents in the household to be able to take care of the child, or even in the case of single parents, uh, whether it makes more sense uh, to have single moms spend less time in the workforce and more time taking care of their own children. Uh, That's a big philosophical divide between liberals and conservatives. And I guess I come down on giving parents the choice not incentivizing by giving a huge um, write-off for child care out of the home, um, but giving parents the ability to be able to take care of those children in family situations, um, you know, to have family members um, help take care or take care of them themselves. So I think this plan Uh, It's worth having a debate about it. The problem with the way this bill is fashioned is that there aren't going to be debates. It's a big bill that they're going to try to pass through reconciliation. There are all of these elements in it that some of them uh, are controversial. And we ought to be having a real debate about this issue. And we ought to come down and take a look and let, you know, advocates of both sides be able to argue their case. But unfortunately, uh, the president did not choose to to do it that way. Bill, do you agree, uh, first of all, that there is a philosophical divide uh, about this? And uh, second, do you agree with Linda that this is not open for negotiation? Well, first of all, there <clears throat> there is a philosophical debate, and it's been going on for a very long time. Uh, I have to say, and this, this may be heretical uh, within my own party, uh, but I find myself increasingly inclined to the view that there ought to be a very generous child allowance uh, with some income cutoffs, and that uh, parents should probably be free to choose for themselves. Uh, I'm sorry, Mona. I've forgotten your second oh, question. Um, do you think there is there is uh, room for negotiation? Do you think the administration is open to the idea of changing the formula so that it's more direct payments to parents and less 
money devoted to subsidizing daycare and pre-K? Well, the, <clears throat> the administration, indeed the president himself, have already made it clear that with regard to the American Jobs Plan, uh, just about everything is on the table for negotiation. I would I haven't heard the president talk about the third bill, which is the families the the families bill yet. I would be surprised if he took a substantially different position. I don't think the administration's stance with these large bills is my way or the highway. I think they've they've put on the table bills. Uh, that satisfy the desires of substantial portions of the Democratic base and and which the people in the White House genuinely believe to be good public policy. But the idea that these bills are just hardened in stone and cannot be changed is, I think, probably not going to turn out to be correct. Damon, there is a lot of uh, survey data from Pew and from others showing that um, the baby and daycare model, you know, commercial daycare setting is not the preference of most American parents. In fact, you know, very large majorities choose very different arrangements. Uh, They either, you know, work part-time, they have more informal daycare arrangements with a neighborhood person or a relative. Um, And frequently, uh, as an American Compass survey found, um, people who are at the lower end of the income scale actually prefer, say they prefer to have one parent stay at home and the other work uh, while the children are very young. So um, that should tell us something, (laughs) that this is not actually the preference of parents. And uh, I'm, I was struck by uh, Susan Rice, who um, the who's the domestic policy advisor to the president, and and uh, when she was doing a um, uh, conference call to explain the program, she said this. She said, "We want parents in the workforce, especially mothers." Um, it it makes you wonder what the priority is here. Is it what's best for kids and families, or is it just this? this idea that it's better if moms are working? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, as in so many issues, uh, I am not with many of my fellow Democrats on this. And it sounds like uh, Bill has come over as well to welcome I Bill. Guess, what's, <laughs> what's, which sounds like a more conservative position, although I want to complicate that in a second, to say that this should, is something that should largely be up to families to decide. And it shouldn't, there should not be an incentive structure built into this so that women are. Uh, driven into the workforce with young children and that that's where they get the benefit. Um, But the interesting thing to me is that the Republicans are also divided on exactly the same fault line because, I mean, you recall uh, with the welfare reform uh, bill of the mid-1990s that Bill Clinton signed, a large of the impetus behind that was to, to get rid of welfare queens, namely mothers who decided to use their welfare benefits to not work and to just stay home with the kids. And that created an incentive for them to get pregnant over and over again and to keep living on the dole in perpetuity. This was the building in of dependency. And actually just today, uh, there was a, 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 there's an op-ed somewhere, I forget where it appeared, by uh, Nikki Haley, who's lining things up for her own 2024 run for president, making this point. She didn't actually uh, do it in the the classier and more accurate way of kind of the uh, 1970s neocons and make the claim that uh, the unintended consequence of democratic policymaking is to create uh, perpetual poverty and dependence. She said, Democrats want people to be poor and dependent. Mm. Uh, that's going to be the line. Now that, and, and you see that divide on the right in the responses to a lot of Biden's moves on this, because of course the, the child 
a lot of the child care related elements of the family's plan are a continuation of what was in the stimulus bill that was passed a couple months ago, trying to make those programs expanded beyond the one year. And ever since then, we've had all these this proliferation of plans. You have the Romney plan, you have Hawley has a different kind of plan, you have all these uh, different options of like when the benefits kick in, when they fade out, how generous they are, do they come through an incentive structure that leads, again, women into the workforce, or is it just a lump sum payment? Is it, it, is it received only if, the, if there are two parents in the family married, or does it just come to anyone who claims a dependent child? There are all these differences among these different plans, and they're because of exactly this fault line on both sides of the spectrum, where you have the more progressive Democrats saying this should all be so that women are in the workforce. And then you have others who say, no, you know, maybe uh, maybe it should be up like myself and Bill who say it should be up to families to decide that. And then on the right, you have the Nikki Haley's who are worried about uh, welfare dependency. Uh, and then others like you, Mona, who are are think that this should be up to parents and that it's good for mothers to be home with young children. So we're 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 pretty divided on this on several fault lines. Or fathers. I'm good with fathers. Um. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> please please it, it, we we must uh, we must be that way. I I was a, 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 a sort of stay-at-home dad for a while while doing some part-time jobs. So yeah. It works both ways, right, absolutely. Right. Look, um I I, I want to hasten to um reassure our listeners, as I know there are going to be some who might have tuned in late or whatever and are going to say, wait a minute, you're against giving help to parents. No. Uh, what we're saying, what I'm saying, and maybe uh, those who agree can agree, but anyway, is that um, there is a better way to help families, as Linda was saying, than to subsidize daycare and pre-K. Uh, rather, give the money directly to the parents. And the parents, whether they're stay-at-home or whatever they're doing, they can make their own decisions about what works best for their circumstances. Um, and this is, uh, among other things, uh, it's been shown that um, programs that put more money in parents' pockets, for example, the earned income tax credit, actually has more um, beneficial effects on school readiness for children than, uh, than, than programs like Head Start, uh, which has been a decade-long several decade long um, disappointment. Let's just say that uh, it's had some good effects on children's uh, immunizations and health and some other things, but, uh, but it has not affected their academic performance. And frankly, um, coming to you, David French, I mean, I, I, I wish Biden knew a little bit more about the research here that, that shows um, that, uh, that, Pushing kids into a commercial daycare settings um, does not deliver the the benefits that he thinks it does. Like he was saying, oh, when they start in pre-K and three and four, then they're more likely to graduate from high school and more likely to go on to further in their education. That's just not true. Um, the the best data we have shows that actually, uh, like there was a study in Tennessee that took disadvantaged families only. And then this is a gold standard study because it really did uh, randomly assign. So it randomly assigned some kids to get the pre-K program and some kids not. And then they studied them for many years. And what they found is that initially, in the first year or two, the pre-K kids seemed to be doing better on knowing their letters and numbers and that sort of thing. And then by the third grade, then it gradually diminished. And by the third grade, the kids who had not been in the pre-K program, like vastly outstripped those who had. And that and the, and the pre-K kids never made up the gap throughout the rest of their school years. So, I, you know, it's frustrating. Yeah, it is frustrating. And especially when you're going to be talking about just a, a massive expansion of a, a really... Uh, of a of a government a series of government programs in the aftermath of a pandemic when quite quite frankly our public school establishment didn't really cover itself in glory mm -hmm. uh, when it exposed a lot of problems uh, that that had been there that had been there for a long time but became you know much more in sort of in in sharp relief look 
consider me an advocate of the Romney plan. Uh, I, I like the Romney plan on a multiple levels. I'm much more in favor of giving people resources that they can choose to spend how they would like to spend uh, that ease the financial burden, especially on poor families who are bringing children into this world. And if they want to spend some of that that money on on uh, pre-K, if they want to spend some of that money on daycare, they can do that. They can make that choice. If they want to stay home with their kids and that's going to help them stay home with their kids or maybe have fewer work hours to give them more time with their kids, fantastic. And the other thing about the Romney plan was it was revenue neutral. I know, you know, we don't mention that much anymore. Right. <laughs> it's, um <laughs> But you know, a lot of this is I, I there. I read a I read a fantastic, um, and it stuck with me literally for months. Um, a piece by uh, Noah Smith and on his sub Substack, No Opinion, and it says the title is that no one knows how much the government can borrow, and he has this really vivid uh, illustration or this, this really vivid, he paints a really vivid word picture. He says, we're walking down an infinite corridor with an invisible pit. In other words, we don't really know how much we can spend. Uh, we don't know how much we can borrow. We do know there is such a thing as too much. And, you know, one of the things, when you look at that, that Biden family's plan, um, what's fascinating to me, especially in the context of all of the spending uh, let's take one thing, one one element of it, and that is um, free community college. So free community college, which was something that Obama that Obama put forward as a big idea. It's something that actually that my home state of Tennessee does. Um, we have the Tennessee promise. You get two years of free community college here in Tennessee and in, in conservative Tennessee. And it's a successful program. I like it a lot. That would have been a big deal. That would be a big win. That's a rounding error on a rounding error on the total amount of money that's being spent here or being proposed here. And I'm just really growing increasingly alarmed that we're going further down that that infinite corridor and we're getting closer to that invisible pit. And so that's what I like. I like the Romney plan on two counts. I like the Romney plan because I think it, it's putting resources the way the government's actually pretty good at, the government's pretty good at direct deposit. Yeah. <laughs> Send the <laughs> <It's>, check. <laughs> it does it does that pretty well mm. and pretty efficiently. Um, and at the same time, it's also he also pays for the program, which is a, a novel thought. Yeah. Um, Damon, I think you were the one had oh you also mentioned that piece by Noah Smith about the uh, Yeah, the, that yeah. was my yeah. yeah, that was my selection a couple months right. ago. It's a very good piece okay. worth looking up. Um, all right. Well, we have come to the part of the program where we highlight or lowlight something from the week. So, Linda, let's start with you. Well, I want to highlight a piece that appeared in the May 5th edition of the New Republic. It is called Our Friend the Trump Propagandist. We knew David Horowitz when he was a radical leftist, then he became a conservative, then he joined the MAGA cult. And the article is written by Ron Radosh and Saul Stern. Saul is somebody who's been on the podcast. Uh, for those uh, who have uh, followed the career of David Horowitz, who started out as a communist, a uh, bona fide communist, moved to the new left, then to the neoconservative movement, and is now all in on uh, his uh, obey to Donald Trump. He's written a new book called The Enemy Within. And this takedown by two people who've known him literally since high school uh, is well worth uh, a read. Yep. Ditto that. Um, Damon. Um, I'm actually going to note two items on the same subject uh, as kind of a bad and a good option uh, for readers. Um, I will say that the op-ed, I can't say it's like the worst op-ed of the week because I haven't read every op-ed uh, written in the country. Uh, and also, uh, I don't want to be overly harsh on it, but a really bad op-ed uh, this week was by Peter Beinart in the New York Times. Uh, Peter Beinart used to be uh, the editor of the New Republic uh, about 20 years ago when he was very, very pro-Iraq war. He then uh, left that position and has been drifting left ever since. And uh, he now has taken up, uh, I guess, uh, a kind of a kind of uh, far dovish position, and his op-ed is titled uh, "Biden's Taiwan Policy Is Truly Deeply Reckless." 
So the column, it, most of the column is not terrible. It's an analysis of what's going on with China in East Asia, its rise, our response to it, and claiming that Taiwan matters far more to China than it does to us, uh, that uh, you know we would never tolerate a kind of parallel thing happening so close to our borders by a foreign power. And so we're kind of running this major risk of starting World War III, which would be an utter disaster for us and for everybody. That's all debatable, uh, but certainly uh, worth arguing. But then the, the really bizarre thing is that it concludes by saying, quote, recognizing the limits of America's ability to deter Beijing does not mean abandoning Taiwan. The island is an inspiring democratic success story. For it to suffer Hong Kong's fate would be a colossal tragedy. So he ends up then in this position that we really should keep this bad thing from happening after he's just undercut every capacity <laughs> to actually do something to keep it from happening. So for people who want a bad example of how not to think about the challenge of China, there's the Beinart piece. A much better example of how to th start thinking uh, uh, intelligently about it is by my colleague Noah Millman, who I've plugged once before on this podcast. Uh, I could do it more often than that, but it, it seems uh, uh, somehow unfair to highlight one person too much. Plus, also, he often writes for The Week, where I write, and that seems somewhat incestuous. But uh, he does have a column in The Week uh, this week uh, titled The Taiwan War Paradox. And because I've talked too long, I won't summarize it, but it's a very smart piece that looks at how we do seem to be kind of on a collision course with China over Taiwan, but that both sides of the equation are facing kind of cross purposes and in their incentives. And that can both be very dangerous, but also potentially present ways out uh, of a, of a full on confrontation and war. So very much worth people to read that and treat Beinart as uh, something perhaps to be uh, avoided or uh, read only in a negative sense. A cautionary tale. Don't let this yeah, happen to yeah. you, op-ed columnist. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> All right, Bill Galston. Well, I want to highlight. <clears throat> a government report that was released, I believe, yesterday, showing that the American birth rate has plunged to an historic low. Uh, you, need, uh, you need about 2.1 children per woman of childbearing age in order to reach what's called the replacement rate to keep the population steady. Uh, in 2020, uh, the birth rate declined to 1.6, uh, which, is, which is a full half child per woman below the replacement rate. If this trend continues, and there's every indication that it will, because last, last year's results were the continuation of an extended slide in the fertility rate, the American population will age and then begin to shrink. Uh, and there is very little evidence from government policies around the world uh, that you know, pro-natalist efforts actually have much of an impact. It's a much broader societal phenomenon uh, with consequences for the stability and sustainability of, of government revenues entitlement programs, and many other things, and the labor force and the military. It goes on and on. All of this leads me to the conclusion that the United States, like a lot of other aging countries, needs immigration desperately. And in order to make that politically viable, we need immigration reform even more than we ever did and the costs of delay are rising by the year. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, by the way, the um, the country in the world among advanced uh, industrial nations that uh, does not suffer from this birth dearth uh, is Israel. They're uh, they're at about three point oh children per woman which is uh, not just the effect of the uh, ultra-religious because they're a small minority of the country, but uh, it's the secular Israelis as well who are having 
many children. So it's kind of interesting. Um, okay, David French. So I've got a, a couple of things. One in the um, in the sort of political space. St- our the, the dispatch is Steve Hayes. He wrote something. He wrote something. <laughs> he, he wrote a, just a scorching piece called Kevin McCarthy's GOP is Tired of Hearing the Truth. Um, so I, I really recommend that. Um, on a more important note, though, I have two pieces. One is a, uh, a piece and one is a video. And they're related in this sense. Uh, the, the piece, I strongly urge everyone to read the story in The New Yorker uh, by Gideon Lewis Krauss from April 30th, 2021, called How the Pentagon Started Taking UFOs Seriously. Um, really well done piece. You know how some you know how some of these New Yorker long reads are just in a class by themselves. This is in a class by itself and uh, it's fascinating and it mirrors exactly what I'm hearing from people within the Pentagon. So I would urge you to read it. And then that brings me to the other thing which is well, if the aliens are coming, <laughs> Mona and everybody, we need to meet them in the sky, not on the earth. And so that brings me to keep, keep your eyes peeled on SpaceX, the latest Starship test. You can look at it on Google and um, I mean, on YouTube, SN15. It successfully did a high altitude test and landing. This is the vehicle that's going to uh, take us to the moon, uh, back to the moon, hopefully back to or hopefully to Mars. And if necessarily, hopefully be bristling with missiles in low Earth orbit when the aliens come. So uh, that's <laughs> that's my that's my recommendation. Uh, I I'm a, uh, fascinated by a lot of these these reports and that NYU uh, New Yorker story is just really interesting. It it's not credulous. It's not credulous. It pokes holes where holes need to be poked, but it's it's a uh, very interesting. Well, that's interesting. We um, on this podcast, you know, this is not the usual meaning of illegal alien. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you've had low recommendations for a low number of recommendations for UFO we content. Have. I, I know you've blazed a ah. trail, David. This is the first. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Although, you know, if somebody were to write a novel about falling in love with an alien, I bet Damon would recommend that. <laughs> um, absolutely <laughs> all right whenever ufos come up i always say i believe in flying objects that are currently unidentified there you go i just i just <laughs> do not believe they're piloted by aliens okay excellent i'm not we're not saying they're piloted but perhaps a drone a drone can <laughs> nah, we meet in the middle i don't buy it for oh. a second another time uh, perhaps yeah, yeah. Okay. I, all right i, all I right. must say that many years ago i became disillusioned with the whole idea that was the basis for Star Trek um, when I learned about the vast distances involved and that traveling to another planet is actually, I mean, outside of our solar system is not possible when you consider the human lifespan. So um, that was, um, that sort of took the bloom right off the rose right there. But then again, you know, David, maybe your aliens live, you know, for light years of time. Who knows? I have thoughts on that. I have thoughts okay. on that, but we we don't need to. We may, you know, we may have to come you, back and do another podcast just about the UFOs. <laughs> <laughs> All right. In the meantime, I would like to recommend um, this time a YouTube video. So, um, for for a few months now, I have been meaning to study up on this whole rank choice voting issue, and. Um, and I and I've tried to look at it, and I have to admit that my eyes glazed over when I would read these accounts, and I would get a little confused. So Catherine Gile, I hope I'm pronouncing her last name right, um, has produced a YouTube video. Um, it's G E H L is her last name. Uh, Catherine with a K. Um, she is a businesswoman who has teamed up with a guy at Harvard and they have proposed what she calls final five voting. I think that's the name of it. Anyway, her, um, her explanation of how this would work on YouTube is so clear that even I understood it. 
And it is actually incredibly encouraging. We're going to be having A.B. Stoddard on in a few weeks to discuss it further uh, because she just did a piece about this. But I highly recommend if you're interested in a possible election reform that would not require us to get rid of the political parties and would not involve changing to a parliamentary system, but would nevertheless begin to puncture this awful polarization uh, in our society this is really worth a look. So I highly recommend the video and uh, her work in general on this topic. Thank you, David French, for joining us. And uh, we'll look forward to that UFO episode. And thank you (laughs) one and all for listening. Uh, We will return next week as every week. 